All right, and here we're at the uh, Promethei segment of the Fire Saw. Fire Saw is, has always been one of my favorites. Um, I remember when I first learned it from my friend uh, Larry McCoach. Um, I couldn't talk enough about it. I mean, I spread the word all over the place. Uh, I just couldn't stop doing it. I thought it was one of the easiest, uh, most fabulous methods of fire making that I have ever seen. Um, so here, uh, fire saw again begins with the prefix fire, P-H-Y-R-E. Uh, the prefix is, uh, helps keep my organizational names uh, in order <laughs> so that uh, I don't get all confused with uh, uh, the relativeness of all the names. So, as you know, the, the axis drills, everything ends with the suffix of drills. But with the linears, everything begins with the prefix of fire, P-H-Y-R-E which of course represents life supporting fire. Anyway, uh, the fire saw works like the fire plow and it is a uh, push pull with a unilateral force. However, instead of it being that uh, it goes the lengthwise of the base, the base is perpendicular to the blade and goes this way and it looks like a cross. Uh, it could have been that in the old days the, the fire saw was called the fire cross as I read in one of the books which I'll go into later. Um, something I, I didn't I forgot to mention with fire plow but with all the linears in fact any any method it doesn't matter and that's to keep breathing. Okay, so you're you're getting your focus consistency on you know bearing down with doing this method and technique, but you have to keep breathing. And again, one of the reasons uh, of why I talk uh, while I'm doing something is not just to explain it, but for me to remember to keep breathing. So in order to talk, I have to keep breathing. So it's always a good thing to talk while you're doing the method. It's just kind of a reminder to uh, relax and keep your normal breathing rhythm. Okay. So uh, uh, the fire saw, like the rest of the, like all of the linears, requires a little bit of physicalness and some energy, but uh, it's like a sprint. It goes pretty quick. And uh, with a little bit of training and practice, you could do a whole bunch of them in a row, no problem, until you finally you, you finally know your limits, and you just kind of know. After a while, you just know that you know you shouldn't do another one uh, until you've rested up a bit <laughs> and gotten yourself back together. But uh, I first learned fire saw from Larry McCoach, and I can almost remember the day exactly. I went to go visit him. Uh, when uh, we lived up in uh, northern New Jersey in Passaic County and uh, uh, I came in one day and he goes Joe I have to show you this and he had been doing some research on some primitive skills on some fire making and he found had this old book and it didn't have pictures in it it had old illustrations you know like museum illustrations and things like that and uh, he found this thing called the fire saw. And it was just, you know, some simple drawings of a person who had taken some bamboo. It was the bamboo fire saw. And with a simple explanation of what to do with it. To split it, to use the one part, which is the blade, on the other part, which will be the base. And you just rub it inside this hole and you get a fire. Well, he did it. I mean, he did it just as it said and uh, followed as best he could with these simple drawings. And he goes, it, it lit right up. And he showed me, he goes, he, he did everything from scratch, which is exactly what I'm gonna do with you. I'm gonna show you how he showed me. And uh, 
I, I just couldn't believe it, how easy it was, how simple it was, how quick it was to throw together. So, uh, and I just couldn't get enough. So I, I told anybody and everybody that would listen. So I'm very happy to get to this, this segment of the uh, Heat and Denki Dead Show. So, uh, without further ado, let's get into science of the basic form of the fire cell. All right, and here we begin our segment of uh, science of the basic form for the fire saw. Now, I had a uh, 10 foot section of bamboo, which I cut down. Now, the first thing you need to do is find a uh, space between the nodes, okay, which is uh, what I like. It is about from elbow length to fingertip in length, okay? The material you need to select for the bamboo fire saw, we're starting off with the bamboo fire saw, just so that we're clear. Um, you want seasoned, dead dry bamboo, but not rotten bamboo, okay? So you want bamboo that's very solid, okay? But you don't want bamboo that's um, has been sitting out and is really light and uh, uh, a bit degraded, degra degraded uh, like we use with the fire plow. Okay, we don't want bamboo that's a little far along that's been out in the weather. We just want bamboo that's dead dry and a little bit seasoned. Okay, so it still has some hardness and density to it. Uh, the kind of bamboo that I was first using fire plow with and could not get a call. But in this case of uh, the fire plow, fire saw, um, it's going to be a different story. So I'll put those aside. Now the thing about bamboo is if you're around some bamboo, there's, you're usually around a lot of it. There's plenty to go around. Um, with the unilateral forces that happens with the fire saw, you're definitely going to need stakes to pin this board. You're going to have to do that with with the fire plow too. So, uh, uh, in fact, most devices, right? I mean, let's face it. So you can make stakes very easily, right, out of bamboo. So you just find uh, extra segments of bamboo, get them to the width that you would like, right? them down and then you have instant stakes you just point up the ends and you can pin this board to the ground now I really want to show you how to do this on the ground but we're going to keep doing it on our table and just kind of uh, keep using the clamps instead of the the stakes the pins as we would outside okay so what do we do first well you take this section that's fairly intact. I mean, it has two cracks in it, but as it turns out, um, I think they're in the place that I, I really want it to be, in a sense. Now, looking down your tube here, your bamboo tube, you want to divide it into like two thirds and one third. All right? And if your bamboo is whole, then you don't really have to worry about where you're gonna split it. Bamboo splits so nicely. It, it splits very straight as a grass. If you have one split or two, you may need to line up those splits to get them to, uh, so that you don't have splits in either your blade or your base, because both of them have to be whole sections. Otherwise, their stability is gonna be compromised, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do. There's a split here and a split on this side already even though this bamboo is fairly intact. And one side is actually bigger than the other a little bit. So one is kind of two thirds, the other is kind of one third. So what I'm gonna do is take my knife and squeeze it through this one crack and open it up a little bit. And then I'm gonna squeeze it through the other crack 
which has already started. And I'm going to work this crack out through the node. And I'm going to work this crack out through the node. And that starts our split. Okay. So here, we split our tube of bamboo. And we have one section that's a little bigger than the other. So one is two thirds, the other is one third. Okay. Hopefully it's not too twisted. This one's a little twisted. It has a bit of an uh, uh, airplane wing twist to it, a propeller twist to it. But I think we'll be okay. So the blade doesn't matter so much that it has a propeller twist. Um, we'll survive with that. Okay, it's not critical. So we'll just clean it up a little bit. Now there's uh, only two things you really have to do with the base. Secure it and create the hole that's going to be uh, the notch. Now, all you really need to do is drill a hole somewhere on the very top crest of the circle of the tube okay now the, the thing is is that you have to be very careful when you do this when you're digging your knife into the bamboo you could potentially you could potentially um, split the bamboo on some level so you have to be very careful okay you might just run a crack down it and then you'll destroy the stability of the base do not do that, okay? So when you're adding pressure and drilling into the bamboo, do not crack it at all, okay? Not at all. Take your time and really work the blade around to open up that hole, okay? And as soon as you see it peek through the other side, start working from the other side, okay? And there we go. So it's peek through the other side. I'm going to take the knife point, work it through, and be safe, okay? Don't, you know, let your knife slip, cut your hand, cut your leg. All right. Now, how big should you make this hole? Well, that's the other thing about bamboo selection, which I really need to mention, is. Um, what really matters here is the surface area that you need to collect. What is the surface area? The surface area is actually the thickness of the walls itself. This is very key, okay, depending on what kind of size you are. Now, I'm a little guy, all right, so the more surface area there is, the harder it's going to be for me. I don't have that much um, body weight and, uh, you know, musculature to be able to, to, to do something with a lot of surface area. So I have to be very careful about the mean that I'm in with the surface area, okay? So I like, me as a preference, I like one, ex if not exactly one eighth of an inch, I'll take up to half a centimeter, okay? In width of a bamboo wall. Anything larger for me uh, than half a centimeter, I'm gonna really struggle with. And I'm not sure if I'm going to actually be able to pull it off. Now, the walls of bamboo, they vary quite a bit with species and where they grow and how fast they grow. Okay. So, uh, so what I'm getting to is how big do you need to make this hole? Well, I like it to be the hole to be slightly bigger than the wall thickness. Okay. So when I go to lay this blade on this hole, I have to be able to see a little bit of the hole on each side of the wall. Does that make sense? Okay. A hole that's too small, in my opinion, is gonna suffocate the coal. It's not gonna get enough air. That's just my opinion. And it doesn't allow for a big enough coal, in my opinion. So, we're going to open this up to a little bigger than, and there we go. 
that's probably uh, a little over half an inch as a whole. Okay. I mean, uh, half a centimeter. Now, we need to secure our base. And what we would do normally is take our stakes and we would pin this this way and this way, okay? Only on the ends. Now, this is another reason why you don't want too short a base is because uh, you have to have enough space. Remember the variable of space. You have to have room to be able to do the sewing motion. So enough length this way and it being pinned allows you some space to be able to move. I mean, once you get that, uh, with some training and some practice, you would be able to uh, work it out with smaller and smaller pieces. But for now, uh, this is the basic form, okay? So we're gonna take our quick clamps, and the way we clamp them, and the way I cut this purposely, is there are two nodes. These nodes are actually for support that I have chosen for the uh, for where it gets pinned or clamped. Okay, here. So we lay this down and we clamp right on top of the node, which is supportive. Now, if there was no node, um, there would be nothing to support the roundness of the tube and the tube would actually crack, okay? So had that happen multiple times, so don't make my mistake. So we secure our tube right on top of the nodes, okay, and it doesn't crack, all right? Before we do that, though, I have to put uh, a little piece of tinder in there. But uh, for example's sake, I'm just showing you why that's the way it is, all right? Now let's work on our blade. Our blade is approximately a third of the tube in itself. And uh, there's a lot of splintering on uh, these pieces that you cut. They're very sharp. In fact, um, in primitive technology, what uh, native cultures of Asia used to do with bamboo is they used to make a quick knife out of bamboo. They would literally just split a piece of bamboo and the edge is so sharp you can cut meat with it, okay? Now, we don't want to do this with our own skin, okay? So what we want to do is take each of these edges down with our knife or a bit of a file. Now, you don't have to make this sharp. All that's going to matter anyway is the wall thickness, okay? But we're taking this down for two reasons. One, we don't want to cut ourselves or get splinters. The other is, is that if there's splinters on the wood here, those splinters are going to be pushed into the hole and destroy your coal, okay? So what we want is a nice, smooth surface area. So that there's no splinters in our skin, no cuts on our skin, and no splinters in the hole. Now, when you're scraping something like this, uh, some cultures will actually collect the scrapings and use this as tinderbone. So uh, maybe I'll make a little bit more. And we will use it. How's that? Might as well, right? Let's do the other side. Now, you don't have to do this to your base unless you really want to. Alright. I think that's enough. Now, all we need is a large marble size piece of tinder to go underneath here. Because here's what will happen. The dust, 
as it goes in the hole, will fall away and land on the ground. And that'll be away from where the heat is, from where the temperature is being raised. Well, we don't want that. We don't want the coal dust to be away from where the temperature is. We want the coal dust to be where the temperature is. So this little marble sized piece of tinder goes underneath and under the hole, okay? And that holds up and supports all the dust to stay where the temperature is at the hole, okay? Now don't make the tinder push up too hard up against the hole. It has to kind of catch all the dust in one area so that it, it stays there and allows it to be ignited. Okay. So let's resecure our base. Make sure it doesn't get cracked. Okay. Now the way I like to hold my blade is um, I'm right-handed. So my right hand is the power hand, and that's in the rear. And my left hand is a guiding hand, and that goes in the front, okay? In like martial arts, that would be like, if you had a spear or a staff, your power hand would be in the back and your guiding hand would be in the front. Um, just as an example, okay? Now you can, if you want to, make a little notch, just a small little cut that goes across the hole. I usually don't do that um, to receive a bit of the blade so it doesn't travel anywhere. Okay, you want it to sit right on top of the hole. The other thing too is, is that you have to angle the curvature of the blade down so that the wall goes straight down the hole. Okay, now if you hold it like this, where the curve is going out this way, it's actually gonna burn this way. It's gonna burn out of the hole, okay? We want it to burn down this way into the hole, all right? So I take my blade and I tilt it a little to the right. Since I'm right-handed, it's gonna go this way. And what this allows me to do is I can get my fingers cupped underneath in here with my thumb on top, okay? Now remember, there's a ground here, okay? So that doesn't leave any room for fingers to be underneath. If fingers are underneath, they drag along the ground like this, okay? We don't want that. We want our fingers inside the tube blade and a thumb on top and that leaves this uh, free with the space okay same with the guiding hand I'll either stick my thumb inside the groove like this and lay my hand on top for pressure and for guiding another way is to hold uh, do a motorcycle grip Okay, and do it this way, okay? And again, the, the stance is kind of the same as if you're standing for fire plow or fire saw. I like to have, for me, my left foot forward, uh, my left leg forward, and my right in the back. And I get into a bent knee stance and uh, allow my body weight to rest on the blade. Same with the fire plow, which you really couldn't see. But if this is the ground, what I would be doing is kneeling, like double kneeling, like in Seiza, um, on the ground in front of this, kind of like this. Okay? But of course with enough space where my upper body weight just rests right on top of, of the base. This should be pinned with a lot of stability, okay? And I think we're ready to go, all right? 
So again, we want this mated. We want it warmed up. And then you just kind of go for it, okay? And the stroke length, you'll notice, is about the same. It's maybe six to eight inches, okay? So we get this warmed up. Make sure you're over the hole. I'm a little bit off. I'm going to move over a little bit. It's already starting to smoke. It's already mated. So I'm just going to go. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep breathing. Yep, smoking. So here's what we do. We lift up. Sometimes the tinder or the coal is sticking to the underside. Actually, we have two coals. <laughs> we have one that's stuck to the bottom of the base and one that's stuck to the tinder bundle. That went much better than I thought it was going to. Okay. And I'll just blow on those for a second. And then of course you take these and you stick them inside your tinder bundle. Okay. Now you just saw that whole process from start to finish. Isn't that amazing? Literally taking the tube, making the hole, taking a tube, making the hole, securing it, making the tinder, um, preparing the blade, and doing the technique. It's that fast and that quick. This is why I just couldn't talk enough about it. It's so amazing, it's so fast, it's so quick. Um, and even if you have just simple, quick stone tools, you would be able to pull this off. The only thing you would need in nature is maybe um, uh, a stone saw to just cut the node out, cut the tube out, and something sharp to drill the hole with, or even saw a little bit of a hole in there just to get started. The stone would, you clean up your blade and you're ready to do fire saw. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? I love this technique. I love it to death. It's one of my, always, has always been one of my favorites. Once I learned this, it actually outdid all the drills in a sense. So, but the only thing is about bamboo saw is what? You have to be around bamboo, right? So, if you find yourself in a bamboo grove, you are golden for a fire. So, but that's the thing. So, this is a regional kind of method if you're using bamboo. But it's not limited to these materials. But if you're going to use domestic materials, hardwoods and softwoods and medium woods, it's going to take a lot more involvement in uh, creating the the pieces a little bit more which we're going to go into okay all right so uh we might as well just go right at it so again we have our pad pie which goes from right to left okay problem we need fire um assessment of what it is that we have we're in a bamboo grove, so um, diagnostically, we would say, well, if we know all the principles, understand the variables, we could probably pull off bamboo fire saw. Okay. Um, so our plan is to do the saw, and we need to get our things together. We need stone tools. We need to get the right kind of material it has to be dead dry seasoned not rotten 
the wall thickness has to be just right. We need um, to make and find the proper stone tools to get everything done. We have to stabilize the board. There's a lot to figure out. And uh, then you need to do those things and then evaluate how you did. And here's our evaluation. We got our, we got our call. So going quickly over the variables. Honey, shut the door, please. Um, health. So, uh, <laughs> health. Uh, uh, this is a lot like uh, fire plow. The linear should not, in a sense, really ever, you shouldn't have to worry about ruining your hands like the hand drill. Um, you can easily get splinters with bamboo. Okay, so you have to be very careful. You can get easily cut, and I mean cut wide open, with uh, splints of bamboo. They're very, very sharp, okay? Um, Native Asians used to, they would butcher pigs with just the, with splints like this, okay? And I mean butcher. I mean, they take all the, the skin, the meat off, everything, with just that. So you have to be very careful you don't get caught. Energy, it takes a little bit of energy. It's a bit of a sprint, but well worthwhile. Um, if you prepare everything perfectly, you will get it the first shot. And again, not out of ego, but because you're eventually gonna run out of energy, okay? Um, like you kind of saw me doing with the um, fire plow after a bunch of unsuccessful attempts. But it's good that you see those things, okay? It's important, because that's just reality. Uh, need, obviously we need fresh and fire for, because uh, it supports life. Um, so, that, so the need is really there for the training and the practice to really find the perfect golden means within the variables to make these things work on the first shot, okay? If life really depends on it. Skill and confidence, um, training and practice, training and practice, training and practice. And then um, another thing too is a lot of skill and confidence will come from teaching. If you teach and train other people, um, a lot more is going to a lot more learning, a lot more growth is going to come from that. So I highly recommend uh, teaching and training other people. Okay. Um, again, we call it the the coaching effect, which I heard somewhere, um, where you get just as much, if not more, out of teaching than actually the the student or the person you're transmitting to. Okay. Reason to uh, figure out and balance all the variables keep them within the mean. Your means and resources, understanding what kinds of materials you need, the stone tools you need, or the, the, the right things you need to kind of make this happen. Uh, chemical issues, there shouldn't really be any with bamboo. Um, if you buy bamboo in uh, a hobby store, it might be coated with some kind of polyurethane or something like that, so be careful. Um, moisture and humidity. You do want seasoned bamboo. Okay, try not to use green if you can help it. Honey, don't touch that, please. <laughs> you see what I have to work with? Um, density and hardness. Again, you do not want you do not want rotten, um, degraded, degraded bamboo. Okay, you don't want that. You don't want soft bamboo that's been sitting out in the weather. It will literally just crush on you. Um, you want that for a fire plow, but not for this, okay? Not for fire saw. And we'll get into other woods and hardnesses uh, with other variations later. Fuel, keep going, keep going, keep going until you've, you've truly filled that notch, okay? You kind of have an idea when you uh, need to stop. All right, hold on one sec. Oh, my 
seat on her. Uh, containment and the notch. The notch has to be just the right size. Okay, too small is going to smother the notch. Okay, trust me on that. And it won't allow the hole to really form. So the notch, the hole, should be just larger than the width of the walls of the bamboo that you're using. Okay. Uh, air, the size of the notch is going to be a big deal with uh, allowing the coal to be able to breathe. Okay. Pressure, get your pretty much your whole body weight as much as you can um, on that uh, without breaking your blade. Okay, which which can happen, which has happened actually. I've had thinner blades and they would just they'd snap on me. So you kind of have to have a balance of uh, as much pressure as you can get on that blade across the base to raise that temperature um, and to abrade uh, coal dust into the notch to raise that temperature, get that temperature up. So a big thing of temperature is going to be speed. Okay. Uh, back and forth reciprocation, all right, again, we have this unilateral force, and uh, it has to be very stable, okay? So you're going to find what's your good stroke length. Don't think it's, it's a very long stroke. It's actually just as far as a uh, quick push-pull. Really no more, it shouldn't be more than really eight inches. Um, in fact, if we measure the burn mark, can you see the burn mark on the blade? If we actually measure that, it's actually five and a half inches on me, okay? So uh, that's all that my stroke length has to be there, all right? Um, at uh, the, lin the linear motion. You gotta keep a straight line. Okay, if you start uh, deviating from this line, you can't do a saw like this, okay? It can't be a rocky motion. It has to literally be straight across, okay? If you do this, it's like drilling with this, like if you're drilling, if you're doing one of the axis methods, it's like having one side come up and the temperature is, is getting cooler on each side. Plus there's, the surface area isn't really making contact. Okay, so if you're doing this, it's getting colder and it's not making surface contact the whole, the whole time with both walls of the base, okay, on each side of the base. And the only thing about the line, at least in this case, is that you don't want it to burn in a circle because of the shape of the blade. It has to burn down, straight down as, as best as you can, as much as possible, okay? So you gotta keep that line. Duration and time, you kinda just have an idea when you're done. Um, you may just wanna think that, okay, I probably think I have it, but keep going as much as you can without destroying the coal. If you think something is gonna break, like you're, you're, you're uh, blade or your base definitely stop okay and see what you got so uh, but just keep going as, as much as you can and create a little bit more coal extender or uh, give your coal at least a chance to uh, start forming and breathe under there okay uh, speed speed is a big deal so take your time warm it up uh, made it warm it up, and then go to town. Again, it's, speed does not mean it's a race. Speed only means trying to build up that temperature, okay? Uh, space, give yourself plenty of room for this motion, okay? This, it's a, once you start sprinting too, you don't wanna have something in your way, okay? Make sure that the stakes or the pins are not in your way. Make sure there's not any kind of branches or anything in your way. Make sure that you are not in your way. Like your legs are out of your way if you're hunched over this thing that you're not hitting your, your thigh or something like that. Make sure you have room to, to do that stroke properly, okay? Surface area, make sure that your wall width is uh, the proper mean 
for yourself. Again, mine is an eighth of an inch to half a centimeter. And if it gets more than that, it gets really hard for me to actually pull this off. So, all right. And then uh, on the opposite side, the base, um, hopefully you're using the same exact uh, side of the tube, the other side of the tube. But uh, surface area here means uh, one side of the hole and then the other side of the hole. Okay, so it's not just the surface area of the blade, but each side of the hole that's burning, okay, to create that coal. All of those things happen together as surface area. Stability, as you know, is key. If this thing started coming apart during the, my sprinting motion, I would have been in a lot of trouble. I would have just had to stop, okay? And I probably would have had to start all over again. Because um, the other thing too, is is uh, once you do these holes, that's it, that one is done, okay? So this thing starts to look like a, a flute in a way. You have holes that go all the way down the length of the base as long as it's still stable, okay? So you see all these this bunch of holes and it kind of has a, a flute-like appearance to it, which is very distinct of the fire saw, okay? The other thing too about your blade, okay, is that when you start burning here, it kind of uh, convexes it inside, okay? So you have one side that's higher, you have where you burnt in, and then you have this which is lower to the ground and this is which is lower to the ground. And you could start dragging your, your fingers. So what you have to do is put your knife on this side of the burn, and take that down. And then you do that to the other side. Okay, so that you even up your blade again. And then you kind of smooth things out again. Everything is reasonably straight again here, instead of this being lower and this being lower. And you need to do another hole. If you have more, more tinder, get another marble sized hole, put it under that hole, stabilize it, and you're ready to go again. If you have the energy to, to go again, that is. But you should be good for at least, I don't know, a few, all right, before you really totally are done and you truly need a break, okay? Um, in the beginning, you, you may need longer breaks than uh, at first, but with practice, you could do a few in a row, definitely, and, and still be fresh. So, the problem is doing these in front of demos. Um, so we have a saying, you know, uh, and it's from the movie, The Ghost in the Darkness. The one with Val Kimmer where he hunts the the lions of Savo in Africa. Uh, those lions are at the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, there's a scene where Michael Douglas is talking to Val Kimmer after he had tried hunting uh, the lions with a gun he had never used. And the gun uh, misfired on him. It, did, it just it didn't work because he borrowed it from somebody. And he had never used the gun before. So when the time came for him to have to shoot the lion, the gun didn't work, and he was, um, <laughs> he, he was, had his pants down, right? And uh, so Michael Douglas says to him, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, it's not the exact words, but he said, uh, you went into battle with an untested weapon, so whenever you're doing a demonstration in front of people, Never go into battle with an untested weapon, okay? Uh, use the piece that you've practiced with, that you know you can do it with, that you have your strategy with, okay? And uh, stick with that. So, um, for now, we're gonna call this uh, Science of the Basic Form, okay? Um, I am going to show you one more thing uh, 
Now, in fact, I'm just going to leave everything for part of the variation. So, honey, fix the camera, please. Okay. No. Back this way. Okay. So, uh, we're going to go into Art of the Variation next. And uh, you'll see some pretty cool things. There's a lot more variation to this than there is the fire plow. So, uh, let's get started, okay? Thanks for your patience. Alright, so uh, we're entering our segment of Art of the Variation, and uh, so from this point on, now that you kind of have an idea of how Fire Soul works, I uh, want you to practice that a bit for a while, and uh, get that down, and uh, then we'll get in, uh, try all these other different ones that we're going to go over now. So, uh, the next one we're going to do is, uh, there's no real name for it, I call it the Manila method because uh, this is really the way it's done, I think, in the Philippines. And uh, if you go on YouTube, there's a camp in Subic Bay of the Philippines called Jest, J-E-S-T, and uh, there's an instructor there, a couple of instructors there. And, they're always doing the bamboo fire saw method the way that I'm going to show you now. Now, the way I'm going to show you now, um, I first saw it demonstrated to me by uh, my friend Barry Keegan, and uh, many years ago. And great guy, um, takes stuff really, really far when he's practicing all the primitive skills. So, what's very interesting about the change up? in the way we're going to do it this time is that actually the base is the part that actually moves. Now most of the time it's the male part of the core two, right? Uh, with the spindles, the drills, it's always the male part that moves and the female, the base part is always stationary. The only time you, I think, seen that change is when I did the class one uh, pressure lever base, B-A-S-E, and uh, where the lever made the base move up toward the drill. Uh, that's kind of different. But in this case, the blade is going to be completely stationary. It's not going to move at all. And the base is going to do all the moving. So how do you create this version? Well, it's like this. You take a tube of bamboo, okay, again, seasoned and dry uh, and not rotten, all right, and it should be about approximately uh, maybe a navel high or a xiphoid process high, something like that. The highest I would go is probably like chest high, okay, really, because the way this is going to be is you're going to take something soft, like a towel, or a shirt, or a buckskin, and you're going to wind this up and put it either in your abdomen or near your xiphoid process, careful not to break your xiphoid process, that could pierce your liver, okay? Either way, this has to be stationary. The way I like to hold the bamboo tube, actually, is it in my hip? I hold it in my hip, and that way, I can also lay it on my thigh at the same time, so that it's supported, so that it's not just hanging in midair. And you'll see why right now. Okay. So this tube, I've already cut a small slit here, and I don't want it to go more than halfway across. Okay. Now what I want to do is take a section out of 
between two nodes here. All right, so I'm going to take another cut. I'm going to try and line it up. Again, you would use stone tools. you'd carefully whittle that out with your knife. Now what you have to do really is be careful not to crack the bamboo. This has to be very stable. Now I have a saw cut here and a saw cut here that goes about halfway. Okay. Now the next thing I need to do is pry out this piece. So I'm going to take my knife point, be careful not to cut myself or crack the rest of the bamboo. I only wanted to crack down to this other cut and then down the other side of the cut. Okay, so we're going to start that carefully. Okay, looks good. So now I'm going to run the knife down to the other cut. Good. Now I'm going to start the split. On this one, good. Careful. Run that down. Good. And I'm going to finish. There we go. Okay, so I took this piece out. Now we have half that tube sitting there. Okay, between the nodes. Don't cut into the nodes. Okay. You want it between the nodes. The nodes uh, give it a little bit of strength. Okay. Now the next point here. Is we're going to need to, like your blade, uh, you want to get the sharp edges away from here, okay? So that you don't cut yourself and you don't splinter yourself. But you're also making tinder at the same time, okay? So we're going to clean this up. Maybe get a little tinder. Now this is not your blade, this is your base. This is your blade, okay? So we're just cleaning this up. Help avoid any cuts, because you're gonna be gripping this and you don't wanna cut yourself, okay? Because our health variable is very important, safety, okay? Now we're gonna clean up our blade, because this is our blade. Be careful while you're doing this that you don't slice yourself, not only on your knife, but on the bamboo, okay? Remember this other side is very sharp. one side, but dull both sides so that they're not dangerous, okay? And here we have our marble sized piece of tinder. Now, like we did with the base of the version you saw last, okay, we have to carefully to not crack this piece, okay? So when you're drilling in, only apply enough pressure to gouge out wood. Do not apply so much pressure that you split the bamboo. If you do that, you will ruin its stability. Okay, it'll be no good. And as soon as you see it pop to the other side, dig to the other side. Now, otherwise, everything is pretty much the same, okay? The width of the walls for me is at or between an eighth of an inch to half a centimeter. The hole I'm making, which is the notch, the containment, is slightly bigger than the width of the wall. Okay? And there we 
go. All right. Now, since you're around bamboo, there's usually a lot of splints around. So, let's see. I'll use... I have one here. Just a small section of bamboo. Now, all I need to do with this is place the marble-sized piece of tinder there with the little piece of bamboo. And I hold this down like this. Okay. So, and you can see the reason why I scrape these sides down. Because since I'm gripping it like this, I don't want to cut my hands open while I'm moving this back and forth at all. Okay. So this doesn't need to be a really tight grip. Don't press down very hard on the splint that is holding down the tinder, okay? Because you're going to end up crushing the coal that you're trying to create. You really just want to hold that in place with your hands while this operates, okay? So now I think we're ready to get set up. So I'm going to close up the camera for us a little bit. My daughter plays in the background. I play with it. Yes, I know. This is how much this is. And, um, <laughs> it's very long. Alright, let's see how we go. Oh. Alright, so I take my towel or my pad. I put it in my hip, and I have the end of it here up against one of the runners on the table of my uh, fire dojo. So, but you could use a rock, a log, something that's very stable, a root, the bottom of the base of a tree, okay, something like that. Now, I'm, I want one side to be higher than the other, okay, when I'm doing this. And you get to pick which side, so let's see. I think I'm liking, I think I'm liking the left side of this wall. Okay. Now I'm going to take this. Okay, this is the base. And the base is going to be moving back and forth. You to fix the tinner here. Again, don't grip the splints tightly. You will crush the hole to death. Okay, you want it to breathe. Right. Place the hole on the wall that you've chosen. Seems that I'm glazing it. Let's get that glaze out of there. Okay. Getting some friction. Make this together. You can see it's starting to smoke. Again, you want to light up the wall with the hole. didn't collect. Alright. So I'm going to make a new hole. We'll try that again. Okay. Alright. So we're ready to give this a second chance. Get set up here. I like to put this in my hip. I like to rest the bamboo tube on my thigh. And I made a new hole. 
on the sliding base. I have the tinder in place. I have my splint holding that tinder. Okay. And I have to get this thing mated, warmed up, and then get ready to go. So it seems like it's mating well. Okay. So we're just going to go for it. A lot of speed. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. And let's see what we got. Oh, I think we got it. Here's what we do. We carefully turn this over and there's our coal on our little marble piece of uh, tinder. Okay, you get a close-up of that. And you place that little piece of tinder into your awaiting larger tinder bundle. Oops. And this is uh, like a reverse version of the original version you saw inside, so the basic form. I'm going to blow on it a little bit. I wonder if we can get it to light. So, uh, uh, so it's the base that moves. Okay, so the female part of the core two is what's really moving in order to achieve the, the friction for the coal, to give birth to the coal, okay? And I call it the Manila method. Um, just because uh, it's common in the Philippines that that's the way that they teach it. And again, I first learned it from Barry Keegan many, many years ago, that version. So uh, I'm gonna show you a variation of that right now, of this, of uh, how to save on your bamboo. Um, as you can imagine, it involves reload. Uh, which I'm famous for now, right? And uh, do a couple more versions after that. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so I just showed you the uh, what I call the Manila method, which is where uh, the female part of the core two, the base, actually does the moving around and uh, on the blade, the male counterpart of the core two. And we're going to do a variation of that. And how this one is done is uh, you need either two very large branch pieces or very small sapling pieces. In this case I'm using some sections of bamboo. Um, these two sections you're going to put a point on here I just cut the bottom here to uh, it's like a wedge because this is going to go like a stake in the ground okay. now the other thing too is you need to split the top in order to hold the blade okay um, to keep the split from going all the way down throughout the whole section you need to uh, tie that off with some cordage. And here I did that here and here with some artificial sinew or wax nylon. This one I have already hammered into the ground. 
right? Now, here's my blade. A section of bamboo, okay? And uh, here I did this. There's a node on this end and a node on this end. It's a little over a foot long. And as you can see, I tried to get this blade as straight as possible on the curve, okay? Without it being too, uh, the width being too thin, okay? There's enough width on there to withstand the pressure, all right? And to, uh, when it starts to gouge in with the burning, it's gonna get weaker. So there has to be enough meat on there, all right? So we measure out the distance of our blade which is gonna go in the splits. Okay. So it'll be about there. You need to line up the splits. Then uh, you take your a rock or your hammer or your log. Okay. I'm gonna I'm at least gonna look primitive by using the dogwood. The section of dogwood that I have. not to break your steak. Try to keep them even if you can. Right. Now the blade is going to fit inside your split. Try not to break your blade while you're doing it. this in here. Alright. Good. Now a variation of this would be you just have one stake. And you hold this end on your uh, in your hip like we did with the with the manila method. Okay. If you don't have something to um, hold it against, like a tree stump or rock or a log or something like that. Again, we have our female counterpart here. Okay, now you can see we we burned one, the first one there. I have another hole next to it. Again, this starts to the start looking like a flute as you go down the the whole piece there. Okay. Now, when I cleaned up the blade, see it's not sharp? I cleaned it up by scraping it, okay? So I wouldn't get any cuts, but uh, no, we don't wanna push splinters into the hole either, because that'll destroy everything. And with those scrapings, I made our marble-sized piece of tinner that we need. That goes inside again, over the hole with our splint which holds it in place. We're not gonna press down too hard because uh, we want the coal to form inside the hole with the tinder bundle. We don't wanna push the coal dust out. We're gonna hold that in place. And again, we gotta do our steps of mating, warming up, and then going. Are we in place? Yes, we are. Again, the bamboo is on a curve, okay? So you have to uh, adapt with that curve to keep, the when it burns in, to keep that straight. So I'm actually holding the female counterpart on slightly an angle, like this, instead of straight across. It's on a slight angle to meet that curve so that it actually burns straight into the hole. So let's mate it. I'm gonna say that it's mated. And now we're warming it up. I can already smell the wood burning. Now, uh, it just got done raining. It's a little wet out here. So I'm kneeling on some cardboard. Because every time I have to do something outside, Always rain.
All right. And that's got it, I believe. Yep. There it is. All right. We have fire. Literally. All right. On to the next one. Here we go. All right, so our next one is a fun little variation. Same theme. And here I have a two by four pine stud, okay? Which is about uh, a little over, about a foot and a half long, okay? Now here, what I've done is taken two squares of two by four, okay? And I've glued and screwed, I've glued and screwed in these sections, okay, drilled holes to receive two sections of rattan, okay, and the rattan actually goes down into the two parts of the stud. And as you can see, they've been cut in a wedge and they have recesses here to receive the blade, okay. Now the length between the two bamboo pieces is about a, almost exactly a foot because a foot long ruler fits right in there okay so my blade needs to be a foot well we just did the uh, the version of this outside with the bamboo stakes so I'm taking the same blade okay as you can see here where it's burned that's where we just did just now and I'm gonna flip it over now. I'm gonna flip it over and use this side. I mean, I could fix this side, but I'm, right now I'm gonna flip it over. And I've cut it down. I took the nodes off to make it so that it's a foot long. So we're gonna fit our just gonna fit our blade inside. Then, as you can see, with most of my reload devices, it has wings. And you know what they're for. To secure down with the quick clamps or some kind of clamp to my table. All right. Here's uh, the female base counterpart we've been using. Here we're on our third hole right here. And I don't have bamboo scrapings. I'm going to use a little marble-sized piece of jute. Again, that's going to go there. Here's our bamboo splint. That's going to go there. We're going to carefully put that together. Now, the length of your 
female counterpart here, the base, which moves, uh, only needs to be at a length where you can comfortably get your hands on both sides. All right, to have a good grip. So it doesn't really need to be this long. And again, we need to do our process of mating. Okay, it's on track. Now this time the angle, the angle of the bamboo is going this way. Okay, so the female base is on a little bit of an angle because it's cutting in this way to my left. All right. We have to adjust for that angle. It's definitely mated. You can smell it burning. It's starting to warm up. It's starting to brown. So we're going to just go faster. A little bit more pressure. get knocked out. Oh, it was so close. Alright, so we're gonna try that again. Here's our fourth hole. It's starting to look like a flute. Alright. That burn doesn't look too bad as a gouge, so we're just gonna keep going on that. Alright, let's make this. And again, with all of these linears, it's less pieces, more effort. So you require a lot of energy. So if you don't get it the first time, the second time, third time, you have to have the energy to keep going. Okay, you must keep going. And that was only, whoop, I actually dropped it. There's our culpa. <laughs> I think it caught on my finger. Should we blow it in the flame? We haven't done that in forever in a day. So we put this inside our tinder bundle, fold it over, give it a window, right? Blow inside the window, make sure it has food and air, food and air. starting to get hot. Let's hold that with some sticks. And there we go. Then you start feeling like Tom Hanks in uh, Castaway. I have made fire. Alright. On to the next one. Because there's plenty more.